Uh, we talk a lot around here about these 10 practices for becoming, as you well know, if you've been part of the church family for any time at all, that we're very committed to learning from Jesus, how to love like Jesus, and how to live as Jesus would live if he lived right here among us in the 573. And when we talk about this last column especially, what's it look like to live as Jesus? Uh, there are four practices there that we think are a pretty good indication that's happening if you see those showing up in your life. Uh, one of them is, I bless my neighbor. And that's not a new idea to us, and that's not language we just like made up or anything. It's actually a tradition that's been going on for thousands of years among God's people, and we think it still matters a lot. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about why that matters so much and how it might actually work out uh, in our lives, all right? Uh, this starts at the very beginning of God even having a people. He talks to Father Abraham about this very idea. Look at it again. This is a review for some of us. Genesis chapter 12, uh, I will make of you a great nation, God says to Abraham. I will bless you. I'll make your name respected. You will be a blessing. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. In other words, it's always been God's dream, his idea, that his people would be his hands and feet in the world to the benefit or blessing of other people. And of course, uh, after several hundred years of that happening, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully among God's people, the Hebrews, uh, God comes to show us precisely, definitively, what it looks like to be the hands and feet of God. He shows up in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, the Son. And when you read the stories of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll discover that Jesus was always a blessing to the people that he's with, to the places that he's in. So God starts something with Abraham. He continues something uh, with Jesus as God himself is embodied among us. We just talked about the B-I-B-L-E in the last series in June. And one of the things I mentioned in that series is that the Apostle Paul is the master of connecting the old story of God's people to the new story of God's people. And here's what he has to say about this. Understand then that those who have faith are children of whom? Hmm. So anybody with faith in here today, we are children of Abraham. We may not be genetically uh, Hebrew, ethnically Hebrew, but we are children of Father Abraham. Scripture foresaw God would justify the Gentiles by faith. In other words, this whole faith thing wasn't going to be limited just to the Hebrews. Everybody else was going to be able to get, on, get in on it too. And he announced the gospel. Kind of an interesting use of the word gospel. He announced the gospel, the good news, in advance to Abraham. Listen to the gospel. All nations will be blessed through you. We know that Jesus shows up through the line of Abraham, through the Hebrew people. And Paul goes on to say, so those who rely on faith, meaning all of us who are relying on faith, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We are still children of that original promise and that original purpose. Blessed to be a blessing. God's people here for the benefit of other people. That's been true from Abraham in the beginning, through God's Hebrew people, to Jesus who shows us finally and fully what that looks like, all the way up to this current day, over the last couple of thousand years since Jesus was here. It's a tremendous thing that we're stepping into as God's people to say, today, if we're going to live as Jesus, we also will bless our neighbors. And that's the good news that I'm proclaiming for us today. I love this so much. As God's much-loved children, we have access to the blessing of life in God's kingdom of love. Catch that. We already have access to the blessing of life in God's kingdom of love as people of faith. When we notice where God is at work in and around us, we get to help him extend that blessing to others where we live, where we work, where we learn, where we play. We get to continue what God's been doing since the beginning. Now, 
If you've been around Meadow Heights for, for a few years, you know that I bless my neighbor is not new language. As I said, we actually have double clicked on it. And there are five blessed practices that they're in, on the wall every single week here in this facility. Uh, and today they're also on the stage marked with these signs. Uh, five sort of sub practices because it's a legitimate question, I think, to ask, well, what does blessing my neighbor look like? I mean, it sounds like a really good idea, but like tomorrow, what would blessing my neighbor, which neighbor, and what would I do exactly for that to occur? And that, my friend, is the question you should be asking. That is the question these five blessed practices are designed to answer for us. And so let me just walk you through them real quickly. Um, first of all, we begin... I don't know if I can pick these up and put them back down in the same spot they were or not, but this is prayer. We begin with prayer. How you begin something matters a lot, all right? And yes. And then second of all, the L in bless stands for listen. We then listen for those promptings that help alert us to maybe God's working there. Maybe God's working in that person. Maybe that's what he's doing in this place. We pay attention and we, we listen to our neighbors. What are they telling us about what's going on in their lives? We pay attention. In Get Row Groups, we call this compassionate curiosity. And it's a beautiful thing to offer to another human being, to simply listen to them. I'll talk more about that uh, next week. And then uh, they put the my favorite one right here in front of me, apparently. We eat. The E in bless stands for eat. We eat meals with people. It is hard to overestimate how important a shared meal is if you really want to start to get to know somebody better. You want to take the relationship up a few notches? Eat with that person sometimes and see what God does to open your eyes to who they really are and what he's maybe up to in their lives. And then eventually you have an opportunity to serve. The first S is serve. We begin with prayer. We listen to our neighbors. We listen to God. We eat with our neighbors. We find ways to serve them. And if we're doing those things, it probably won't be that hard to figure out what's some way that I could actually serve them in a tangible fashion, all right? And then the last S stands for story. Not only am I listening to their story and where God may be at work in their lives, maybe in ways they've never even attributed to God yet, but I'm also looking for an opportunity. Maybe the door will open and I can share a little of my story about where God's been at work in my life. And when those two stories come together, something beautiful happens. So B-L-E-S-S, I bless my neighbor. And if you want to know what that looks like specifically, these five practices will help. And so what we're going to do for the next few weeks is we're going to wrap up summer by spending one week on each of these practices so we just kind of get these back to the forefront of our minds because these are the kinds of things we see in the life of Jesus. And if we're committed to live as Jesus, maybe they ought to show up in our lives if we're going to still be the blessing people of God this world, this country so badly needs. Listen to me, friends. This is such good news. We're God's much loved children, and we know it. And so we are already have access to every blessing of life that is available in God's kingdom of love. We're already tapping into that. And as his children who are tapping into those blessings, we get to help him extend those blessings to other people where we live and work and learn and play because we are called to bless our neighbors. Now today, I want to talk about this idea of beginning with prayer. Just a couple of things for you to take away. One is I think when we begin with prayer, we are much more likely to notice more of God's work. We say all the time, God's always present and at work. It's not that God isn't working, it's just that we're not often paying attention, right? We're not noticing where God's at work in people around us or in the places that we inhabit. By the way, I think this is a huge relief because sometimes the pressure we put on ourselves is to create the work. It's, we think it's our idea to design it or to develop it or to come up with it. And what we see in Scripture over and over and what we teach here is mostly we discover it. Mo I like this word. Mostly we discern where God is already at work. And when you begin in prayer, you're probably much more likely to be able to do that. Isaiah the prophet says this about God's work. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, my plans are higher than your plans. 
what that says to me is God's up to stuff I can't even imagine yet. And when I pay attention to what God's up to, it might blow my mind. Oh, that's what you're doing? Oh, that's what you wanted me to do today? And Jesus even comes along and kind of doubles down on this. He says at one point, my father is still working and I'm working too. And at different points he would say, I'm just doing what my father is already doing. He was quite clear that he was here to do what the father told him to do. Listen to me, Meadow Heights. I know these are challenging days in our country. I know that a great deal of the time we have no idea what we're going to wake up to on the news tomorrow or go to bed to tonight or, or, or sometimes we don't even know how am I supposed to even care about it or pray about it or what do I do and it's challenging. I can't answer all those questions, certainly not this morning. I'm looking for some of those answers myself. But what I can do today is remind us of this. Our good Father is still present and at work in our world. Amen? He cares about all of it even more than we do. He's actively working in the lives of people you share space with. He's working in places where you show up on a regular basis. And he loves those people even more than we do. And so we pray for them. And maybe, maybe, get this with me, maybe we pray for ourselves to become the kind of people who will notice what God is doing. To say, God, I want to be the kind of person who so easily discerns your activity and the places I'm going to be in this week and the people that I hang out with regularly. Like, boom, I just notice that. I'm so sensitized to it. So we pray for people and uh, we pray maybe that God will open their eyes or their curiosity or whatever, but Mostly we pray, God, show me what you're already doing. I trust you're already doing something. You love those people. Help me get in on that if I could help you in some way. And the places that we're in, maybe your neighborhood or your street, maybe your whole town, maybe where you go to work or go to school or the ball field or the coffee shop or the gym or the grocery store, wherever you inhabit on a regular basis, say, I'm praying for this place as I walk into the store or the coffee shop today. God, open my eyes to whatever you may be up to in this place. Here's our commitment. I will pray for the people and the places in my life, okay? And of course, along the way, I'm praying for me. God, sensitize me to all of this. I heard a story about a grandma who's in town visiting her family in early December, and of course everybody's thinking Christmas, especially the grandkids, and one evening, as was their habit, they were going around the table just before dinner, and each person was taking time to pray briefly, and they get to the youngest kid, and the youngest kid uh, starts with, dear God, pauses for a minute, and then starts screaming his Christmas list really loud. Wagon, red rider, bicycle. And he's on and on and on until his mom finally whispered and said, son, you know God can hear you. He said, I know he can. Grandma can't. <laughs> now, a couple of things I take away from that story. One, I think sometimes that's how we approach prayer. Like if we beg and plead and scream loud enough, he'll pay attention and do something about it which is really weird when you think about it just like that, isn't it? Like he doesn't already know, he doesn't already care, he's not already working. But you know what I think I love about it even more? Is that we think prayer is getting God to pay attention to us when maybe the best use of beginning with prayer is getting me to pay attention to him. Amen? Amen. He's the one who's present at work. He has perfect love and care. He's not distracted. I'm distracted. <laughs> I'm off point. I miss the clues he's leaving all the time every day. And so really what it comes down to is do we trust? Do we trust that Jesus is present and at work and cares more than we imagine and that he can't wait to share that work with us because that's what God's always been doing? If that's where we come from, if that's our posture, not begging and pleading and screaming something, hoping God's awake today. But if it's a matter of, I'm joining in with something already going on, that changes prayer entirely, friends. Prayer's not something to check off my spiritual to-do list this week so I can be a good Christian. Prayer is something I get to do. Like the, the creator God of the universe is giving me an invitation to participation in what he's already up to. And I could get in on that if I just pay better attention and prayer can help. It opens me up to the spirit, focuses my mind and heart, gets me back in that reset mode we were talking about this morning that I hope this gathering does for us. 
A missionary to China said one time, don't have your concert first and tune your instrument afterward. Maybe prayer is how we tune our instrument first before we go out there and join in the song that the Creator God has been playing from the very beginning through the entire universe. So maybe when you're getting ready for work in the morning, maybe this fall when you're getting ready for school, maybe during your lunch break, you take a moment to intentionally just pause and say, God, I don't know what this day will be like. I don't know what's going to show up at work. I don't know who I'll run into, but I'm here. I'm ready. I'm fully awake. <laughs> Invite me in. Maybe you're headed to the coffee shop and you say, God, where are you at work in this room? Is there anybody in this coffee shop that could use a kind word, a word of encouragement, a smile? Is there anything I could do? to bless somebody in this coffee shop before I leave in a bit? You're at the locker room or on the ball field, and you say, God, I just love these people. <laughs> I'm so glad I to play ball with these people, or whatever sport it is you're playing. And God, I think you love them even more than I do. Help me remember that. I want to be part of whatever you want to do in their lives. If I could be part of that, I'm up for it. Invite me. I pray for the people in my life and the places that I'm in. And then don't forget to listen. Because we're not begging God to show up. We're waiting. He's waiting for us to wake up. And sometimes if I'm not quiet enough, I don't hear the prompting of what God wants to do in my neighborhood or the person on the other side of the coffee shop or that new family moving into the apartment building. So God brings somebody to mind. He points something out in the room. And I'm ready because I began with prayer. I have good news for you today in a very bad news world. We are God's much-loved children. We have access to every blessing available in his kingdom of love. And when we notice where God's at work in and around us, we get to help him extend those blessings to other people where we live and work and learn and play. We just have to decide, am I ready for the invitation? Prayer helps us get ready. And here's the second thing. Think when we begin with God in prayer, we're more likely to surrender to whatever it is God shows us. We're more likely to say yes when he points it out. So, first reason we pray is to be open to the invitation. The second reason we pray might be so I actually do the participation <laughs> when I get the chance, right? Uh, many of you have probably heard of Beth Moore. She's a pretty famous Bible teacher uh, over the decades and author and so forth, um, her memoir, I'm a sucker for a good memoir, and uh, her memoir, um, All My Knotted Up Life, one of the most moving books I've read in the past couple of years. I've never considered myself like a fanboy for Beth Moore or anything, but I read that book, I'm like, wow, this woman has some kind of life. It was super compelling. I could hardly put it down. She tells a story about sitting with her Bible open, headed to probably to teach her Bible somewhere, at the airport, waiting on a flight, and she's praying. And while she's praying, she notices an old man in a wheelchair who was really thin and slumped over, and his hair was long and tangled and an absolute wreck. And she says she tried to ignore them, ignore him, but something in her spirit wouldn't quite let her do that. Here's what she writes. I had walked with God long enough to see the handwriting on the wall, I have learned when I begin to feel what God feels, <laughs> something sometimes so contrary to my natural feeling that something big is about to happen. I immediately began to resist. I started arguing with God. Oh, no, God, please no. Don't make me witness to this man. Notice, by the way, her assumption was, like the only thing she could think of was, I need to witness to this man. And then I heard it, I don't want you to witness to him. I want you to brush his hair. The words were so clear, my heart leapt into my throat and my thoughts spun like a top. And so after she's argued with God about this for a little while, she heard the invitation. <laughs> she finally surrenders to the participation and she awkwardly approaches the guy and she kneels down beside his wheelchair and she asks him, may I have the pleasure of brushing your hair, sir? 
to which he responded at volume 10, little lady, if you expect me to hear you, you're going to have to talk louder than that. <laughs> and so she said she took a deep breath and she blurted out, sir, may I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? At which point every eye in the place stared right at me and I watched him look up and down at me with absolute shock on his face and then he said, if you really want to, are you kidding, she says, not to him. Of course, I didn't want to. <laughs> but you see, she had already begun with prayer, and she'd already decided if there was an invitation, she'd participate, even if it wasn't something she really wanted to do. She wanted the participation. She said, God didn't seem all that interested in my personal preference right then. Yes, sir, I would be pleased, but I don't have a hairbrush, she says to him. And he says, I have one in my bag. <laughs> And so Beth got the hairbrush and she started brushing and here's what she writes about what happened next. I love this so much. A miraculous thing happened to me. She's there blessing him by brushing his hair, but the miraculous thing happened to her. As I started brushing that old man's hair, everybody else in the room disappeared. There was no one alive for those moments except that old man and me, and I brushed and brushed and brushed until every tangle was out, and I know this sounds so strange, but I have never felt that kind of love for another soul in my entire life. I believe with all my heart that for those few minutes, I felt a portion of the very love of God. In other words, I felt the love of God loving this old man through me. I was just the hands and feet of God in that moment. The emotion was so strong and it was so pure, it had to be God's love. And so she finishes brushing his hair and she kneels back down in front of him and she felt the need for some reason to, be, I guess, to look him in the eye, she says, and to say, do you know Jesus? And he said, yes. I've known him since I met my bride. She wouldn't marry me if I didn't. I haven't seen her in months. I had open heart surgery and she was too ill to come see me. I'm about to get on this plane to return home and see her. And I was just sitting here thinking to myself, what a mess I'm going to be <clears throat> for my bride. Thank you for brushing my hair. I know that sounds a little dramatic. Beth Moore's a fantastic storyteller. And you might think, yeah, that stuff happens to people like Beth Moore, you know, flying around the world in airports teaching the Bible. You know what I think? I think as God's much-loved children, we already have access to every blessing available in his kingdom of love. We're living in it right now. And when we just pay attention and notice God at work in and around us in ordinary ways, we get to help him extend that blessing of his love toward others where we live, work, learn, and play. Here's what Beth says about that incident. Only God knows how often he invites us to be part of a divine moment, and we're completely unaware of the significance. It was a God moment I'll never forget. Now, I love sharing stories like that with you. I love reading stories like that. I've read that story so many times, and today I can barely keep from crying reading it again. You know what I love even more? I love living those kinds of stories. Amen? Amen? You know what would be even more amazing? Is if that was in the very DNA of our church family to live as Jesus, <laughs> that blessing our neighbors just felt like our first impulse. Not a forced one, not a second one, not one we have to work up, but we start practicing it. We start practicing it in very concrete ways, and over time, it just happens more and more that we get to join God in what he's already doing in somebody's life. They were sitting there the whole time, but until I begin with prayer and I get ready to participate, I might not hear the invitation to do so. Would it be amazing if we caught it every day? Father, how could I join you today? I'm willing to participate. Invite me. Show me. Even if it's a little weird or a little awkward, I think I'm up for it. <laughs> Give me a shot. What a difference it would make.
if we would just begin with prayer, I think we'd see more of those kinds of opportunities in ways that maybe we can't imagine, but God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I bet he's just waiting for us to participate in something he deeply longs to do for somebody or some place where you live your everyday ordinary life. And friends, it's my considered and deeply convictional opinion that nothing would change the world more than the love of God showing up in the hands and feet of his people on a regular basis like that. Could we pray to that end before we go? Let's pray one more time. We've done a lot of praying today. That's a good thing since we're talking about prayer. Bow your heads with me. <laughs> Let me just guide you through two or three things you might want to reflect on in prayer, and you could also take them with you into your week. And maybe the first one is to say kind of the invitation piece. God, help me notice your invitation. Help me to notice people <laughs> and, and to the places that I'm in, people where I could be your hands and feet in some tangible way. Help me notice. I think the second prayer would be maybe the participation part. Father, if you invite me, my answer is already yes. <laughs> I'll even take the gamble that it could be something weird. But my answer is yes, I might need your help. And then I think maybe the third prayer is transformation. Start with me, Jesus. I want to become the kind of person who blesses others, who lives as Jesus in my world. Whatever in me resists that, isn't well-tuned to that, tune me up so I can play that song, the song of all creation. Transform me, God. Father, I look out at this room, I imagine all of the people on the other side of that screen who are part of this gathering right now. I think about all of the people whose lives we'll touch in the next 167 hours until we gather like this again. I think of all of the places that we will be, all the neighborhoods we represent, all the workplaces we'll go to, the ball fields where we'll hang out, the restaurants where we'll eat, and the stores where we'll shop. I think, Lord, of how much access you have to this world through your people if we'll simply notice where you're at work and be willing to join you. God, I pray for big and little moments this week. I pray mostly that we'll be attuned to them, that we'll be ready, that we won't miss them, that our awareness will be on high alert. And I pray that we'll begin with prayer to that end. So we'll hear the invitation and we'll join the participation of what you're up to in a world, Lord, that so badly needs more than we need anything else, so badly needs the love of God. May we give it out in great measure in the name of Jesus who gives it to us.